Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Today for Natural Resources, we are going to kind of continue with talking about ecosystems on the planet. We finished talking about biomes, and now we're going to talk about marine and freshwater ecosystems. Okay? And marine and freshwater ecosystems are like the equivalent to terrestrial biomes. Okay? Uh, there are going to be some factors that determine you know what kind of ecosystem it is and you know what we're gonna call it and those kind of things and we'll go through this in today's lecture alright so um, we'll also at the end of uh, you know this lecture on marine and freshwater ecosystems I'll bring in a lot more on this kind of stuff what are some of the um, features that could be drastically changing marine and freshwater ecosystems. Um, where are some of the uh, key components that we need to talk about and need to have regulations on? Um, whether that be you know fishing, you know, pollution, nutrient loads, uh, what's the temperature of the water, you know, from climate change, pH or acid acid of the oceans and that's not just from uh, like a marine standpoint we can also talk about this from freshwater ecosystems and we will um, when we start talking about you know, how the collection and utilization of natural resources can damage ecosystems all right <clears throat> so first marine ecosystems I mean clearly they're um, important because about 75 percent of the Earth's surface is covered in ocean and so we're talking about a huge amount of area that is controlled or is part of the marine ecosystem. Now parts of the marine ecosystem have photosynthetic organisms, um, algae and other plants that um, can do photosynthesis and that comes in the you know into play whether it's algae or phytoplankton which is free floating plants or you know kelp or anything like that these organisms have the capability of taking photons and converting photons and carbon dioxide into carbohydrates glucose now, <clears throat> most of the photosynthetic activity is going to happen where light can penetrate the water. Okay? And um, because a lot of these organisms are going to need to still take out nutrients from the water source from you know, being rooted into uh, the soil or from being established on you know, coral reefs or you know, something where the light can penetrate. We will talk about ways at which energy is converted where light does not penetrate in a little bit. <clears throat> but like, just like a terrestrial system, when organisms die, they fall to you know, the floor or the ground. Okay? In the case of marine ecosystems, they fly, fall to the sea floor. They become decomposed. The nutrients go back into the system. Right? And then those nutrients can be used by organisms that occur in, you know, on the benthic area, which is what we call the floor of the ocean. But one of the key components is the way at which nutrients get back into the system. And it's called upwelling. And upwelling is when currents can stir the ocean, much like um, when we talk about... Uh, turnover in a lake, and I'll talk about this when we get to freshwater ecosystems, but turnover in a lake is very similar to upwelling in the ocean, and that's where the nutrients are being brought up by the currents okay, and deposited throughout the um, pelagic system and okay, throughout the water system, and that allows for organisms to take up those nutrients and continue photosynthesis or continue consumption and growth and things like that. So you'll see bands um, throughout the world, you'll see bands of high productivity where these upwelling events occur. Right? And we can look at a map of that. So you can see this band here, 
is due to the current from South America reaching the current from North America and it causes an upwelling event right here and some of you again um, who might be interested in going to the Galapagos okay you see this little dot right here um, of productivity okay it's kind of orange so orange on this map or yellow on this map is high productivity green is a little you know some product productivity red is real high productivity but green is you know productivity but dark blue is basically no production um, no biological production so you can see this little dot right here well that's the Galapagos Islands it occurs right at the upwelling event of the two currents okay we get other upwelling events you know in the north around California okay, Washington up into Alaska okay, on the eastern parts you know in Maine in this region Europe and you get all these upwelling events, which means the nutrients are bring, being brought up from the floor of the ocean up into the regions at which organisms can use the nutrients and still do photosynthesis. Okay. All right. Um, whoops. So uh, when we look at marine ecosystems, uh, marine ecosystems can be stratified. And um, that stratification occurs, so there's a vertical stratification. So in other words, there's a difference between the bottom, okay, which we call the benthic community or the benthic part of the marine ecosystem, and the pelagic part, or what we call the water above the bottom. Okay? And it depends because there's, there's other ways that we can break down the pelagic region. There's other terms and I'll show you them in a second. Um, and it depends on the depth of the environment on how you know how far you have to travel before you reach the benthic um, region. Uh, so how deep is the pelagic region? Well, you know these kind of things. <clears throat> but this is stratification, a vertical stratification in the marine ecosystem. So the deeper you go Often the slower growth is, okay? but um, that concept can also work against things. So cold water, so areas that have you know relatively cold water will hold more oxygen, and so the areas that hold more oxygen will have a higher level of productivity. So in some regions, the surface might be warm and below that is cold. So the benthic region could be highly productive while the surface region, the pelagic region, is not very productive. In other regions, when you, you move like towards the poles, okay, it's the pelagic region that's still cold, okay, but that's the region that's most productive. And we'll, we'll kind of look at some of these in, in a little bit. Okay, the area that's close to the shore or near the shore is called the littoral zone, okay? and that zone is normally where uh, you would expect photosynthetic organisms to occupy. Okay, because it's typically more shallow, and littoral zone is also the regions where you're going to often find uh, wave action that could affect um, organisms. Um, the life cycle of organisms. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at some of this in a little more detail. Okay. So <clears throat> littoral zone or the intertidal zone okay, is affected typically by tides, so either high tide, low tide, okay, and that can change where the littor littoral zone is represented. Okay. But again, it's going to be along the coastline um, of you know whatever terrestrial habitat you're looking at. Okay. Now, the pelagic zones are typically broken up into three main zones. The epipelagic, which means the surface where um, light penetrates all the way through the epipelagic zone. Okay. The mesopelagic zone, where light will penetrate into it, depending on you know, the different regions where um, you're at, where you're looking at the mesopelagic zone. And the bathypelagic, which um, often has very little light production okay, at certain times of the year. Other times of the year, you know, um, this could be still have some light production and 
near the continental shelf could have some photosynthetic organisms living in this region. Okay? Now, some of those organisms that we talked about uh, previous to this, photosynthetic organisms that we call pelagic organisms, they have the capability of moving through these zones. So you might have um, some photosynthetic organisms at you know, night that are in the bathypelagic zone, okay, resting there. And then they would move up to the epipelagic zone during the day so they can do photosynthesis and then move back down um, at night. Okay, So they have the ability to kind of ride the tides per se. <clears throat> the other zones, this is part of that benthic zone, okay, is the abyssal zone or the abyss okay, and the hadal zone. Now the, these areas, um, rarely do they have photons that reach down here um, with enough uh, energy to drive photosynthesis. So in these two areas, um, you're rarely getting much photosynthetic photosynthesis going on. Okay? And they start at about 4,000 meters. So for those of you who don't you know, do that conversion very easily, all you got to do is times that by three and that will give you your feet. So about 12,000 feet down is where the abyss starts. Alright, so let's look at that Hadal Zone community. It's often considered you know, a desert because we're looking at the open ocean and um, a desert meaning that it's not completely uh, devoid of biological life, but um, there's a lack of nutrients in that region, and there's lack of photosynthetic you know, properties in that region, and so you, you sometimes get dead zones where you're not going to find much, much life in the Hadal Zone in, in the open ocean. But sometimes you also will find um, things like the Sargasso Sea where you get these currents that can get some upwelling in these open oceans and you get these uh, product productive zones right in the middle of the ocean. Now, another piece of the Hadal Zone is that it doesn't, the energetics doesn't have to come from photosynthesis. Um, sometimes it comes from what we call chemosynthesis. <clears throat> and so these are organisms, microbes and other organisms that are associated with the microbes that have the capability of converting chemicals into energy. Sulfur and things like that, they're coming from heated, uh, heat vents on the benthic zone uh, of the ocean. And so these organisms can be extremely adapted to really harsh environments. We're talking, you know, 350 degrees Celsius. For, for your information, you know, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So we're talking about boiling water and extreme pressure. You know, maybe you know, 20,000 feet down. Well, um, somewhere in those ranges, you know, uh, extreme pressure in those regions, and um, the organisms still can live there and produce and um, and thrive there. Um, now, <clears throat> I don't like to represent this as a biological desert. I like to represent this as uh, more like a biological mystery box, because a lot of what we know about the ocean the benthic region of the ocean is very limited and we have not studied it very much and on top of that it's extremely hard to study because you say well why don't we just reach down and grab a big mass and bring it up well by the time you get that through the pressure zones whatever it was is pretty much exploded into just biological particles right? and there's no like resemblance of what that life was. So then you might say, well, why don't we just send cameras down? Well, we have, but there's, you know, some regions that it, even at that, we're, st we're still limited by our technology. 
the pressure um, can cause the cases to, you know, to break, but also we have lighting issues and other things that are going on in those regions. Um, and we're getting to we're getting better. We definitely are getting better. Technology is getting there, um, so we can start mapping the the sea floor and the biological communities in those regions. And we're learning day by day that it's not really a biological desert. There's a lot of organisms down there that are doing some really interesting things um, that we just haven't discovered yet. So here you can kind of see some of uh, what we call serene, sea worms or sometimes called marine worms. Uh, and they're occurring next to these heat vents. You know, there you can see species of crab. Um, and some other organisms that occur in these regions that can feed off of these chemosynthesis uh, beneficial bacterias and, and microbes and things like that um, that occur at these heat vents. Now, um, how much biodiversity is there? We don't really know, but we do know that um, there is biodiversity and the nutrients that are coming down from the death of organisms up there is being picking up from these organisms and sometimes can be uh, <clears throat> redistributed because some organisms like um, some whales have the capability of traveling down to these regions and consuming food and then bringing it back to the surface um, so they can get this you know, nutrient cycling through um, like whales and things like that. All right, so the coastline. The coastline is by far the most productive portions of the ocean and that's because most of the energy that occurs on the planet comes from photosynthetic organisms. So because the coastline, the light can penetrate the water, you have a lot more um, photosynthesis going on. Right? And this is where you will find coral reefs and this is a high um, diversity or high level of diversity in these regions um, you know close to matching the same level of diversity that we would find in tropical rainforests you'd find in coral reefs in different types you know it depends on the coral reef okay. the other thing that we are, I need to talk about is what a coral reef is a lot of people are confused by what a coral or what coral reefs are Coral reefs are not plants. Okay? Coral reefs are animals. Okay? Coral is in the form of what we call a polyp. So if you look in, and you know what like a jellyfish looks like. Okay? Now take that jellyfish and flip it upside down. Okay? And then allow for it to secrete calcium carbonate. Okay? That is what a coral reef is. A bunch of little teeny microscopic organisms that are in the polyp form okay, versus the medusa form. So, um, you know, when, when you see a jellyfish and it's going like this, you know, through the water, that's the medusa form of the jellyfish. The polyp form is the kind of the reverse. It's upside down, tentacles are up. Okay? That's what a coral reef is. Okay? So these organisms, coral, are living animals that excrete calcium carbonate and that's what makes the coral itself. Now on top of that they have a symbiotic relationship with a species of algae. Different species, different I mean, different coral have different symbiotic relationships with different species of algae but they have these symbiotic relationship with algae which the algae is in their tissue and algae can do photosynthesis. So the algae will do photosynthesis, give the coral polyp carbohydrates, the coral polyp itself will consume material that's coming in to the ecosystem by grabbing onto it and eating it, okay? and it will give the nutrients for the algae to make more carbohydrates, and so it's a nice symbiotic relationship. Now the issue that we often will have though is when you disturb the ecosystem, coral reefs, you can get what we call coral bleaching, and what that is is when the, there's enough pollution or enough change in the ecosystem, the polyps of coral reef 
start spitting out their associated algae. So they start just kicking it out. And instead of being able to do photosynthesis anymore, they, they just don't have the capability any longer. The coral becomes what we call bleached, and it turns white. No photosynthetic properties, and the coral dies. The animal dies. Okay? And there's lots of situations where we've seen um, different things like temperatures rising in the ocean, increases in uh, carbon dioxide, which increases how much acid is in the ocean, sewage runoff, um, all kinds of things. Um, new introductions of new pathogens, which can cause coral to go through this bleaching process, this expelling of their algae partners. I mean, it's sad to see that um, coral reefs are being destroyed because it's, to me, it's the same as watching someone cut down a rainforest okay? or watching a group of individuals cut down a rainforest. These are the areas, you know, coral reefs and rainforests, these are the areas that the majority of organisms on the planet, besides humans, live. Right? This is the highest species diversity in these two regions, yet it's also regions that we destroy pretty often. And we've destroy, destroyed about <clears throat> one-third of all the coral reefs on the planet have been destroyed. Okay. And the estimate by UNESCO in 2016 would be that about 60% of what's remaining will be dead by 2030. Okay. So one-third's already gone, right. and then 60% of the two-thirds that is left will be gone by 2030. Okay. Um, this, is, you know, this is going to be a drastic change. And, and it's one of the um, most important pieces of the environment that we really need to save because with the loss of coral reefs, we're going to lose a massive amount of oceanic biodiversity. And recently, um, these areas have been deemed very important for you know tourism. Most people that go to beaches and things like that um, in the tropics, they want to see fish. They want to see organisms. They want to see crabs. They want to see, you know, living things when they go snorkeling or just swimming or scuba diving or whatever it might be. And so the protection of these environments are very important for ecotourism and economically uh, support a lot, of the, a lot of the societies that live on the coast. We'll come back to this. We'll talk about ecotourism. We'll talk about the benefits, the costs. Um, how much money can be made and whatnot later. Okay, so a typical coral reef, you know, around um, an island habitat, you know, another one here, another one here. Okay, all these islands have coral reefs around them, and um, not only are not only are they important for you know the biological life. But they also protect the island from storms. So these coral reefs are it's kind of like a, a barrier. Okay? And one of the coral reefs is called the barrier coral reef. But um, it's like a barrier from sea storms. So yes, the waves will hit these. And you'll see giant waves and stuff coming off coral reef. But that just means that the giant waves are not washing away all the sand and the nutrients from the terrestrial environment. That also brings me to mangroves. And mangroves are, are another important piece of the coastline that occurs in oceanic regions. Mangroves is a type of tree, or types of trees, right, that can grow in salt water along coastlines. Um, so there's a lot of diversity that can be associated with mangroves. So fish and shrimp and crabs and all kinds of things can utilize mangroves and the root masses and things like that to house their young, lay their eggs, whatnot, um, as, a, as a piece of protection, especially when coral reefs are not in the region. Okay? They also stabilize the shoreline from you know, being washed away by constant wave action. And um, they have been in the past cut down for timber, 
but a lot of the mangroves in most of the region are now protected because the mangroves themselves, a lot of the species are an endangered species now um, because of the amount that have been cut down in the past. All right, now this transition between a um, freshwater system and a more saltwater system okay, is what we call estuaries. So these are kind of bays um, or bodies of water that are brackish, meaning that they're not, you know, to the level of salinity that you would see in maybe an ocean. Well, it depends on the time of the year. Okay, for sure, um, but uh, or time of the day for that matter. But uh, they have environments where there's a lot of fresh water input. So a river is going to enter the ocean and you're going to have these estuaries where you might have high amounts of fresh water during certain parts of the day and then when the tides come in, you might get high influxes of salt water. Okay, and that can really drive uh, differences in ecological communities. Uh, <clears throat> now, salt marshes, okay, these are kind of like wetlands, um, like freshwater wetlands that you would see on a terrestrial landscape, but they're going to get flooded by salt water. So they're not freshwater, but they're not completely salt water either. Okay? And again, you can get a high level of biodiversity occurring in these regions. Because the nutrient richness really comes from that river input. So everything that's dying, everything that's falling into the river, when it makes it to the ocean, it's just a huge mass of nutrients that are coming in. So there's plenty of nutrients. It's shallow, so there's typically plenty of salt. And then on top, or sorry, plenty of photons, plenty of light. And then um, there's this transition for especially like freshwater species that are moving to the ocean. It's not quite ocean water, so um, it's not quite the level of salinity that you would expect to see in the ocean. Um, so they, it's kind of a staging zone. So you can have a staging zone of um, you know spawning fish or self shellfish and things like that, or juvenile fish that would stage there. But the opposite is true. Also, you have some fish that are trying to go into the river system, and they would stage in these regions also because it's you know kind of easing them into a freshwater system. Okay? And there's lots of threats to these systems. Um, sewage is a big one because uh, a lot of cities and towns dump sewage, treated mainly, and it depends on the country, but especially in the United States, it's treated into the river and then the river flows into the ocean. Okay? But a lot of that sewage, a lot of that sediment is you know, going to be dumped right there in the estuary. And, and you can have huge nutrient loads that can cause massive problems. All right, tidal pools. Really, I'm not going to talk much about these um, because they are very limited as an ecosystem, um, mainly because they change so often. Right? Now, they can be a good source uh, um, or a way at which organisms can escape waves and um, get trapped in tide pools and things like that for other organisms to consume them. So I'm not trying to downgrade the importance of tidal pools, but um, they're, they're limited in the sense that they only occur for part of the day, typically. Um, so a tidal pool might, you know, not be there during high tide. And then, you know, when low tide comes around, that pool exists, okay, but then it's gone when high tide comes back in. So um, there are some species that have specialized to adapt to the, the changing environment. Okay? But for the most part, uh, this is not a true ecosystem that I'm going to talk about in this course. Barrier islands, um, I mean, every day this is a news article, okay? Um, narrow strips of sandy beaches that, uh, unfortunately, um, people build on. And, uh, you know, the purpose of the barrier islands is 
you know, well, one of the benefits of the barrier islands is that it mediates storm rages. So it's the region that's going to get destroyed by a storm. So the terrestrial environment, it's not. But we love to live on water. I mean, pretty much every city is built on water. Right? And, um, you know, people, if you gave them the choice, of course they're going to live on the beach. I mean, who wouldn't? I would. Okay? But also, you've you got to realize that this beach is only there um, because all the vegetation has been destroyed by storms previously. Okay? And you get massive storms and waves and things like that that can destroy these communities. And there's lots and lots of examples of this. I mean, every single one of these houses, um, you know, will be destroyed by storms eventually, right? Because the erosion is going to happen. It doesn't matter what you do. I mean, you can come and dump sand and rocks in here. It makes no difference. The ocean will take that stuff away and eventually take your house away. All right, moving to freshwater systems. I'm going to try to fly through this, but I'll come back and I'll talk more about freshwater stuff because I'm a freshwater ecologist, so I like a I like it a little more than the marine environment, um, and it's a little more easy for us to talk about that being a kind of a landlock um, institution. Uh, it, it's easier for me to discuss issues with freshwater ecosystems than it is marine because it's closer to home for most people that are watching this. <clears throat> now, freshwater ecosystems are two vertical zones in lakes, the epilimium and the hypolimium. Okay, the epilimium is warm upper layer, okay, and the hypo is the cold deeper layer um, that doesn't typically mix except for during fall turnover and spring turnover. Now there is a line, a distinct temperature line, okay, called the thermocline that separates these two layers, the hypo and the epi. Um, it separates those two layers, and most of you have probably experienced this. If you've ever jumped off a cliff into a lake or dove really deep, you probably went from warm water and then all of a sudden you got to cold water, okay, and you can feel this transition zone. That's the thermal okay? And just like the ocean, the bottom is called the benthic zone or the benthos zone. Okay? And the zone that where you know a lot of plant life is going to live or really close to the shore is called the littoral zone. <clears throat> so you have that epilimium, thermocline, hypolimium, benthos. Okay? Now what's what's going on in you know lakes in the fall and in the spring, lakes will become really murky. It depends on the lake, but a lot of lakes will become really murky and uh, have a lot of sediment and things like that. What's going on is the temperature of the surface water, the epilimium, is cooling down. Okay? And water is most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? So when the surface water becomes 4 degrees Celsius, it will go down okay, to the bottom. Okay? Because the water at the bottom is also 4 degrees Celsius. And it will cause this cycle or this um, up lifting, okay, just like upwelling, just like in the ocean, except for now it's caused by a temperature change. Okay? And so you get this upwelling and, and the nutrients from the bottom will be stirred to the surface and you'll get this lake turnover is what we call it. Okay? And that happens in the fall when temperatures get cold, so the surface water gets cold and you get lake turnover and it happens again in the spring when the surface waters warm up after they've been frozen or go over the winter now not all lakes will have this happen it depends on where the lake is located and you know um, based on the temperature of that environment and things like that now terrestrial ecosystems obviously will influence a lake and they'll influence rivers and streams and things like that from the point of, you know, not all the nutrients are self-made. Not all the nutrients occur within that system. A lot of nutrients, a lot of um, things will be coming from the terrestrial habitat into the system. Okay? And so that could be, you know, 
things that we don't want, like agricultural runoff and things like that. But it also could be really simple things like leaf litter and stuff like that's coming in um, from the outside sources. And we'll come back and we'll look at uh, you know examples of how this can change an ecosystem, how this can change a lake's um, you know uh, inhabitants and and what's happening in the lake. All right, wetlands. Hey, wetlands are just areas where water covers the area for um, a portion of the year. Normally, um, we're, we're looking at it like a third of the year, it has to be kind of covered with water. Now, that's just a rule of thumb. Um, sometimes, you know, things will be considered a wetland and they might only have water covering them for a month. Um, but most wetlands and permanent wetlands will probably have water in that area for you know at least half the year if not the whole year. A swamp is a wetland with trees. A marsh is a wetland without trees. Okay? And bogs and fins okay, are soils that are waterlogged. Okay? So you might not see any standing water in a bog and a fin. Okay? But the soils themselves are completely saturated. And if you walked on these, you could feel the soil squish. Okay? And, and in doing so, you probably release some of the water to the surface. But um, you know, a lot of these you just don't you don't see surface water, it's all underneath um, in kind of the the soil. Okay? And a lot of this has to do with you know the plants that are going to inhabit the surface, like peat mosses and things like that. Um, which will just hold the moisture down and um, only releases after a massive amount of water or after something disturbs it. Okay. Bogs are pretty nutrient poor areas um, because just like we were talking about when we were talking about tropical rainforests, if you constantly have water in a given region on a surface, the nutrients get washed away, okay? and bogs and fins typically have that issue. Right. Now, the, the nice thing about wetlands, or a key component of wetlands, is normally they're shallow enough that the light can penetrate and um, photosynthetic organisms can live throughout the wetland. Right. <clears throat> now, one thing that we will talk about more is what is the benefits of keeping wetlands on the landscape. Okay. The cost is they take up area and space and they occur in um, some of the most productive lands that we have um, when it comes to like growing crops. But the benefits are they filter water okay, and they can store runoff. And I think a lot of hypotheses on why the Mississippi floods every single year is a result of us dredging wetlands and, and decreasing the number of wetlands on the landscape, which means we have less runoff storage and most of that water is going into the system, which then spills the bank. <clears throat> wetlands are really an important piece of conservation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a huge point of contention when it comes to agriculture and wetlands and, and what's allowed um, around the wetland, what kind of nutrients can you use, what kind of pesticides can you use. Um, and so it's one of the great concerns for biologists because majority of waterfowl and actually majority of species that occur in the United States will utilize wetlands as breeding grounds or at least feeding grounds. Uh, and um, over time, you know, a wetland might convert itself to a terrestrial community, okay? um, depending on the species. Now, if the species are able to uh, utilize a lot of water, um, eventually the plant community in that wetland will absorb that water okay, to a greater degree, and then will be able to stand and then you know, then the ecosystem would be able to. Uh, oversupply, and that ecosystem would be converted from a wetland environment to a terrestrial environment. Um, and this happens quite often. But swamps, again, 
They have trees, like cypress trees and things like that. Marshes, no trees. And then coastal salt marshes are going to have some influx of salt water or oceanic water to make them have a certain salinity. At least some part, um, some portion of the year they're going to have, uh, you know, higher salinity levels in, in those regions. So human disturbance, um, you know, we got, regardless of whether we're talking about terrestrial habitats or we're talking about marine and freshwater habitats, um, the single largest uh, contributor to biodiversity loss is humans converting these habitats to something they find more useful. Whether that be draining a wetland, cutting a forest down, plowing up a grassland, or building a house on a sandbar, um, all of this is, you know, really going to increase the biodiversity loss. For example, if we look at just temperature, er, temperate deciduous forest, this is kind of deciduous forests that occur in the eastern part of the United States. So deciduous forest trees that le lose their leaves. Okay? Um, that's the most dominated biome, human dominated biome. So it's not just the eastern part of the United States, but the western part of Europe. Okay? These are the, the areas that are most human dominated. Okay. which means that they've been the most disturbed. And actually, we've disturbed 87% of all temperate deciduous forests on the planet have had human disturbance um, to the point where, you know, we've cut them down. Tundra and Arctic, you know, deserts are the least disturbed, and they're at about 4%. Okay. So, you know, you're looking at 87% versus 4%, but it's really, well, what, what can that area provide for us. The tundra, not much. Okay, The you know, decid <coughs> deciduous forest, well, housing material first off, and then <coughs> the ability, excuse me, the ability to utilize <coughs> that habitat for growing other vegetation. Yeah. And, you know, like I said before, one of the key components to um, bird inhabitants and waterfowl life and things like that are wetlands. Um, also hugely important for uh, uh, holding back waters and uh, cleaning our pollutant, pollution, uh, pollutants out of water are wetlands and we've done a really good job at destroying them. Okay, About half of all the wetlands in the United States have been degraded, destroyed over the past 250 years. Right. Um, so we'll keep that in mind, and we'll look at what we what we can do to replenish these areas. Do we need to? What's you know? What does it mean if we keep degrading these areas? Uh, and um, what what we're going to have to do in the future if that's the case? So if you look at the human disturbance. Okay, so this is a human disturbance map. Okay, domesticated lands uh, are in purple, and you can see pretty much the entire eastern United States is purple. Okay, all of Europe is purple. Okay, huge portions of Asia um, and India are purple. Okay, and what's left? Well, we have some regions that are, haven't been disturbed at all because they're ice. I mean, year round. <coughs> Other areas that aren't disturbed at all because they're deserts and there is no water. And then, you know, tundra and things like that, there's no disturbance there because the growing season's pretty short. Grasslands and forests, there's some regions, you know, that are dotted regions throughout the world that we haven't disturbed yet. Um, swaths of grassland and forested habitat that we haven't really disturbed yet. But, you know, these purple pieces are definitely encroaching on those environments, um, for sure. Okay. So with that, <clears throat> we'll switch gears a little bit and start talking about populations and how we determine if a population is increasing or decreasing and where those populations can be found and um, more kind of ecological aspects 
of populations next time.